think back through the songs we sang. We talked about um, him living, him dying, and three days he would rise. All the earth will sing his praises. We sang about um, the king of our hearts. We sang about ask the Holy Spirit to be present and welcome. We we sang about, uh, let's see, what was the second song we did? What was the second one? What was the second song we did? Look, yeah. The average person who doesn't attend church, any church, how would those songs resonate with them? Now, for us, they make perfect sense, right? We know we're singing about God's love and God's mercy, God's grace. We get it. But for the average person who doesn't attend a church, how would, they, how would those songs resonate in your mind? What do you think? Would it be difficult? Would it be platitudes or thoughts, kind of ideas, as opposed to something personal? No, that's not to, to question the songs we sang. It's not to do that at all. It is, it, it is to point out something that becomes very real when we dive into this passage. The story that Jesus told right here is easy for us to understand spiritually, right? We know the point he's trying to make. The point he's trying to make is we've been forgiven some massive debt. Would you agree? We've been forgiven some stuff that that would cause us death, right? And so we ought to be forgiving to other people. That's, what, that's really what that's all about. We ought to be helping people understand forgiveness, right? It's a, it's a spiritual lesson that a believer won't miss. But a non-believer might not get to that deep of a point. But could they get the point? Is this a story, is this one of those stories that would kind of go, oh, yeah, yeah, I get that. I can, I can see that. And it, and it would bridge them into it. Somebody who owes a massive debt gets forgiven and then treats people badly. They get that, right? Because that's a justice story. It's, it's a story about justice, and we all love justice. I, I'm sharing that now because I believe that forgiveness, grace, the love of God for so many people is too good to be true. And here's why. Where have they ever heard of a God like that? Think back to when you were a kid. Think back to when you were young. What was your image of God? Fire and brimstone? No, you may have, you may have grown up in a church where there, there were, you, you felt God was a loving God. But how many of you grew up and God was kind of this ominous figure? I mean, he, you knew he loved you, but you didn't think he liked you very much. Right? And for most people, they they hear that that they, they hear of a God or they picture a God who this is not the picture. That's not the image. Again, they, they know he loves because they say he is, and you know, a God is a perfect love is a good God, but he doesn't like human beings very much because all he does is focus on all the stuff we do wrong. Would that be a hard God to get to know? What if you work for somebody who only saw the stuff you did bad, you did poorly, and they constantly pointed it out? Always trying to help you, though. Just want to help you out. Just want to give you a little encouragement, but you can improve in this area. And everything was about the improvement, right? Would that be a, a great boss to work for? It wouldn't be, would it? And, and what if when you made the mistake particularly the ones that were very costly, there was not a whole lot of grace. It was, it was the hammer. The hammer came down, right, and you had to pay the cost all the time. That, wouldn't, that would be difficult, wouldn't it? You notice how most people see God? Is that how you see God? How many of you still see God that way? I mean, honestly, do you still see God that way? We don't, do we? We see God like we look at most of the time we look at our kids or our grandkids. Sometimes our kids, depending on how old they are, man, we might, we might see it that way. But, but our grandkids, man, we always love the grandkids, right? We can, we can bring them in and we can soak them all up. And we see God through fresh eyes. We see God through, it, through the eyes of love. But for many people, 
Where do they, where's the place you learn about God? In the church. What's most people's view of the Christian church in America? Hypocrisy. Well, we are hypocrites. They can come join us because they're hypocrites too. But we are hypocrites, aren't we? What are mo- what's most people's view of the church, of the Christian church in America? Say it out loud. Extreme. Judgmental. Hypocrites. Are we? Are we extreme? Are you an extreme? How many would say you're an extreme? Raise your hand real high if you're extreme. (laughs) Judgmental. Raise your hand real high if you're judgmental. Raise your hand real high if you're a hypocrite. (laughs) Some of those things they think about the church is true. But I want to pose a, a conundrum to you. If the place where people are supposed to learn that God is a loving, grace-filled, truthful, honest God is the church. But they don't see the church through those eyes. How will they know? By people they come into contact with. So... Would you agree with me that probably it's not going to be the, the first place people come to understand who God is, is not going to be inside these walls? Would you agree with that? Say it again. Be the family and the extended family and the friends of the family, right? Most people aren't going to come looking for God inside the walls of the church, Unless they're older. Because older people, we know that this is where you find God, right? You should be able to find God. But most people today, most, people, most Americans today, that's not where they're looking for God. In fact, it's getting harder and harder for them to even look for him. Because we're so spiritual. And talking about forgiveness means you have to have something to be forgiven of which means somebody's got to be judging you. And we don't want to be judged. So the church talking about forgiveness means somebody, you're looking at something that they need, that they're doing wrong and they need to be changing. That's a difficult, that's a hurdle, isn't it? We've got a job to do. And it's a hard one. It wasn't always this way. When we, when most of us were growing up, you knew we, we kind of operated from a perspective of, you know what, we, we, got, we know right and wrong, there's right and wrong, and there's things that we need to change. There's some things, there's some boundaries you just don't bump up against. There's some things you just don't do, and, and when you do them, you're supposed to repent. You're supposed to say you're sorry. You're supposed to go through them. But nowadays, that's not the case. In the words of Tupac, only God can judge me. Is that Tupac? Yes, it was. <laughs> Only God can judge me. And I don't go to church, so God's going to have to tell me that he's judging me. So I get to determine for myself what's true and what's not. So our getting to that space where forgiveness and the state of forgiveness being too good to be true is very real. I, pre- I present that to you because as we go through this message today, I want you to understand that How we see the church and how we see ourselves as Christians has shifted and needs to shift. 2020 did something to America. We all agree. 2020 did something to America when we shut down everything and people got into their space. Church went to Zoom, church went to online, church went to, and we, we, we had to adapt. Everybody had to adapt. Not just us. Everybody had to adapt. And now it is not uncommon for many people that you know to get spiritually fed from their living room. Agreed? And, and get some good stuff. Right? Enjoy some worship experiences because we got big screen TVs so you can see it in, big, in real time. It's loud. You can sing along in, you know, in your own home. And then you got a message that's actually speaking to you in some ways. And you can do so much of this from your own home. 
So the gathering space for worship where people it, that was normalized has become abnormal or less normal. Less normal. Would, would you, is, is that reasonable? Is that reasonable uh, standing? So the, our approach, and, and, as there, and as people have been able to find their, their personalized worship time and growth from God out there, the gap between what we believe about the church and people who come to church, the gap about how, you know, those things about the church where they're judgmental and they're these kind of things, that gap makes that easier. Would you agree? It makes it easier. And so we've got to find a fresh way to be who God has made us to be. Because the church has been sent. Do we agree with that? We are a sent people. But the church up until the end of the 20th century, well, it's, we, it's still this way, but we just don't, we haven't realized that we need to change it. But the church has always been this place to, the, the place where we've expected the people who need God to come here. When in reality, that's not what God built the church for. God built the church to be sent. God says, I'm going to build my church and I'm going to send you guys out. I'm going to send you out. But, and then we get afraid of that, right? And this is what fear is. We get afraid of what that means and do I have to go do this and go do that? I, I'm going to settle that. But we've always expected the church, the Christian church has always expected people who need to find their way here. But I can tell you that since the early 2000s, that gap has been getting wider and wider and wider. And people do not see this space as a place where they'll learn about God. Until they experience it. Until they experience it. Again, I'm going to ask you, how many of you have seen The Chosen? Do you like it? No. Tell me what you love about it. Okay, good. They made Jesus human. What else? Tell me more. What do you love? What do you like about the chosen? What do you love about the chosen? Yeah. Yeah. You propose a little bit of you. You add flesh to them, right? You tell a story that kind of gives you a little safely. You give some context to what might be happening. It may not have happened exactly that way, but it gives you some context that's safe and that's real and that fits the things that are being discussed. Yeah, it allows people to see Jesus three-dimensionally it, as a real person, not as a historical figure that you're learning about, right? Or that we're singing about kind of in abstract, but that you're singing about if we set up some of our songs with a, a scene from The Chosen that you've seen, it would sing differently. Would you agree? Some of them would sing differently. Sure. Anyone else? Your, your, your view of The Chosen, what, 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 what captures you about it? Mom. Absolutely. It shows the disciples as a ragtag group of folks trying to walk with Jesus who don't do it well, who have issues at home, who got issues with each other, who struggle in the this, in this society, and yet Jesus loving them, even when he has to challenge them, correct them, teach them, bless them, use them, restore them. They see, people can see themselves as one of those men or women. I also like the fact that he, he, they add in many of the women who were moving with them too. Yes, young man back there in the back. Yeah, he, he, yeah, he has a sense of humor. He laughs with people. You ever think about Jesus laughing? Remember the, weddings, the, the wedding at Cain of the first miracle? You ever think about the fact that Jesus got invited to a wedding? Do you invite people who are just judgmental to your wedding? 
Do you even want him there? So Jesus was invited to a wedding, a party. You ever been to a Jewish wedding? Man, them things are fun. He got invited to a Jewish wedding because people liked him. That's not what most people think about Jesus. They don't think people like Jesus. Or that he laughed, that he cracked jokes, that he had little, little moments with the disciples where he would wink at somebody. I was why we watched one the other night, and he, I forget who he was, he was talking to, but he winked at him. I'm like, yeah, right. He would do that. He would wink at him. Do you think the chosen is helpful for helping people bridge their lives back to the church? Do you know that's why they did it? Same words, same stories that we read out of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, except they're telling them in a way that people can see it happening not from a pulpit or from a stage, but in real time. And now when you see it, you, have you picked up that sometimes when Jesus tells stories, he's telling the story based upon what's sitting in front of him at the time? Like this one. This is the story. Jesus had been teaching the disciples about how you deal with each other, brothers and sisters. Matthew 18, right? If your brother offends you or sins against you or your sister sins against you, he says, go to them and talk to them alone. Go talk to them by yourself, right? And if they hear you, if you tell them what really happened and how you feel about what they did, you've won your brother or sister back, right? Matthew 18. And then he says, if they don't hear you, take a couple other people with you because maybe it's you. Maybe it's how you're explaining it. Maybe it's how you're dealing with it. Take a couple people with you and try it then. If they don't hear it then, then bring it to the church because there was something about the church that added spiritual weight to a circumstance because we were all trying to follow God and we're all listening for God and we're all trying to find out what's best, right? Would you agree what, what God would want? That's the safest place to be, okay? And then it said, if they, if they don't listen to you then, then the issue's with them. And then you can just, you know what? Just recognize that they don't want to be a part of some, they don't want to be a part of the group that's trying to listen for God. They'd rather just be outside of that. That's what a tax collector and a publican were, right? Just, just, they, they, don't want, they don't want to be governed by this mindset. Then he tells this story. Peter says, so, so then Peter shows up in his moment, said, Lord, wait, 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 let me, let me just, how many times do I need to forgive my brother? Is it seven times? I mean, you know, because seven was complete, you know. He says, how many times do I need to forgive my brother? Seven times? Great question. But I don't think he was ready for this answer. Because he says seven times. Jesus said, no, 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 no. It's not seven times. I tell you, not seven. 77 or 70 times seven. That would make you mad. Wouldn't you agree? Because you're looking, you're looking for the way out, right? You're looking for, I, I just want to pummel the cat. I just want to, I, I mean, seven times is enough. Because offense, he's not talking about a little disappointment. He's talking about offense, something that cuts deep. And you're talking about somebody who's close to you, a brother, a sister. That kind of stuff cuts, right? So Jesus is dealing with him, Peter, in this moment, right? So then he says, okay, let me tell you a story. Let me tell you what this mindset that I want you all to have is. The kingdom of heaven is like a king. Now, a king, everybody get in their mind, they, they live in Rome. They have an emperor, a king, world-ruling kingdoms. The kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with the people who served the king. Who served the king? Everybody, right? So you got a king, a monarch who's wanting to settle some accounts with some people who own money. And when he began settlement, he found a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold or 10,000 talents. Now, FYI, let me just put this in real context. A talent was equal to 20 years worth of wages. So Jesus is really kind of just blowing this out of proportion. A talent was worth 20 years worth of wages. 
this man owes them 10,000 times 20 years. You're talking billions. You're talking lots of money. This is not some little low, low guy. He owes the king 10,000 talents of money. And is brought in, and he says he was unable to pay, and the king said, all right, Tom, you, you know the rules. I loaned you all of this. You know the rules. You've not been able to pay back. I'm going to sell you. I'm going to sell your family. I'm going to sell all your stuff to pay back my debt. And what does the guy do? The guy goes back, and he gets on his knees. He says, forgive me, king. Really, 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 really. Now, can he ever pay back that much money? Really, think about this. But he says, look, please, don't sell my family. Don't sell my wife. Don't sell my kids. Don't take all my stuff. Don't throw me in prison. Give me a chance. I will do everything. I will spend the rest of my life trying to pay you back. I will spend the rest of my life giving you back what I owe you. And the king says, all right, deal. But I'll tell you what. It's all mine anyway. I'm going to cut you loose. You don't owe me anything. You owe me nothing. That's huge. Would you agree? Huge. And the guy goes, and he walks away, and before long, he finds somebody who owes him 100 days wages, owes him three months worth of wages. He owed 200 and years worth of wages. This guy owes him three months worth of wages. A denarii was a day's wage. So 100 denarii, 100 days. He grabs this guy and he says, give me my money. And the guy says, I don't have it. And he says, just give me some time, please. He says the same thing this guy said to the king. And instead of forgiving him, he takes him and throws him in prison for three months' worth of wages. And some servants of the king kind of watched him and heard him and went back and told the king. And the king grabs this guy up and he says, you wicked servant. I canceled your debt. You owed me what nobody could ever pay. And I canceled it. Shouldn't you have had mercy just like I had mercy on you? Wasn't that too good to be true, what I did for you, fella? And in his anger, he handed the man over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back everything he owed, which means he was never going to die of prison. And then he, Jesus says here in the story, this is how your heavenly father will treat you unless you forgive your brother and sister from your heart. You think normal people can understand that story? If I put it in terms of Elon Musk or Bill Gates? Because we're talking that level, right? They owe so much, their debt gets canceled, and then they turn on the little guy. And they demand, they take them to court, they mark their credit. You think they, people could understand that, that story? Because you notice the story started with a story about brothers and sisters. But you notice Jesus didn't use a family analogy? Whoops. Did you notice Jesus, Jesus didn't use a family analogy? He didn't use a family story to tell this story. He chose something that was bigger. That every, anybody could get. Peter's trying to get out of doing something he knows he needs to do. But Jesus is not, he's not playing that game with him. He's teaching him a much bigger story, much bigger lesson. And he used a large debt to himself. Because this is what God is doing. What do we owe God? What does every human being owe God? Everything, our lives. He forgives us our lives. And we owe him our lives. And yet we go out and we hold people account for little hurts by comparison and the debtor's response, he points out the debtor's response actually angered him. You think people could figure out when they say, so why is the church so judgmental? 
What if your answer was, because sometimes we forget how much we've been forgiven? Why is the church so, so harsh? Because sometimes we mix up who the debt is owed to. And we think the debt's owed to us. Let me give you an example. How does God address your sins? You know, the sins that when you were just being disobedient, how does he address it? He forgives you, but sometimes, you know, he'll, God will, he'll let you know that, that, that you, you messed up, right? What happens if you're being, you do it out of ignorance, you don't realize that you're doing it? How does God handle that sin? He forgives it, and he points it out to you, and he gives you the understanding. Look, understand this is, he reaches you at a different point. Well, what happens when it's willful? When you know better, and you do it anyway. How does God respond? How does he address that sin? Does he forgive it? But does he let you realize that at a heart level that because you have a relationship with him? How, how about when you're doing something out of hurt? You lash out because somebody lashed out at you, or you, you, you're hurting, and you're going through some stuff, and you just don't have the energy to put up with somebody right now, and then something happens, and you lash out, and how does God deal with that sin? He still forgives you, but then he tries to teach you how to deal with your hurt and your frustration. How, how, how does God deal with when, when, when you get when you want revenge? And, and you make it a point to, you know, you, sometimes you do stuff out of revenge, fine, 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 you do You'll get it. I'll make sure. I'll make sure I take care of you. How does God deal with that one? He forgives you, doesn't he? And then he teaches you, all right, and sometimes everything you do has a consequence. You're acting revenge. It may come back to you that way. What happens when you sin because you're overwhelmed? He forgives you, right? So why do we sometimes in the church treat every sin as if, of other people, as if it is a willful, vengeful disobedience to God? Maybe it's not. Should the response be different? Should people know? You ever ever meet somebody who just doesn't know? They, They didn't have a home training. They just, did, they just don't know. They're just supposed to treat people differently. Or maybe they do know, but they haven't had the ability to learn it. We're supposed to be helping people learn it, right? God still forgives us. Our challenge is, though, I think this story would make sense to people because it's about justice. Agreed? And we live in a world, especially today, loves justice. Now, what we don't love is we don't know the difference between God's justice and our justice. That's the problem. Is God a God of justice? Yes. So does God make every one of us deal with what we do? Of course he does. Our world needs to see this aspect of the church, this aspect of who God is. But I'm going to tell you, they're not going to learn it listening to my sermon. They might. But they're going to learn it in their interactions with you. They're going to learn it when we're sitting around talking about stuff. They're going to learn it when we're sitting around talking about injustice or justice or struggles or breakdowns in society. Or str- They're going to learn it when we're in those kinds of discussions. How do we present or represent Jesus in those kind of conversations? Because they're not going to come here first for that. They're going to come to you first for that. When they have the big questions. Really, the ones that we take for granted, we've forgotten more about that stuff than they know. How do we help them see that God still loves them, even when their life is messed up? But don't we forget that sometimes? I forget that sometimes. I forget how much God has saved me from. But when I sing about under the Lamb who sits on the throne, be glory and honor and praise... with the whole world echoing that song, that's not reaching most people. It's reaching those of us who get that, 
who understand that, who is fixed, who have our eyes fixed on Jesus' face. I think that's one of the great challenges that the Christian church has, and I know it's one of the challenges that our church has, our denomination has, that every Christian church, the churches that I'm, that I'm leading, the 30 or so churches that I lead, every pastor is dealing with the same thing. Every church is dealing with the same thing. We've gotten so used to being, to, to having all of our teaching and all of our growth and all of our understanding happening within the walls of the church that we've missed out on what it means to be outside of that, to be walking in that outside and sharing those messages with people outside of here. And so what happens is there's this continual disconnect. Or we live two different lives. We have a secular life and a sacred life. You don't have two lives, everybody. We got one life. But we don't know how to, you know, as a matter of fact, I heard it the other day. I heard somebody say, well, two things we don't talk about, politics and religion. Well, that means you can never talk about your life. Because your primary life is a spiritual one, is it not? So if you can never talk about it, wow, what you going to talk about? The Bucks, O-H, right? We have to be in this space where we can see differently. And, I, and I, I, I'm sharing this with you because as we start looking now at who we are as a church, as a local church, and I'm going to give you an update right now on, on, our, on our, our pastoral search and what, what's, what's next. We have to start seeing ourselves and our mission differently. So one of the things we've done is we've, we've hired a, we've hired, the denomination hired a consultant uh, to, who's going to come visit us. He's visited several of our congregations. I've, I've ta- I told you about Keith a couple weeks ago. But Keith Shields, what he does is he comes and he he takes a look. He, he's, not, he's not coming to judge us. He's coming to see us. He's coming to talk to us and see who we are. He's not going to preach even. He just wants to experience our, he wants to experience who we are. Who we are at center point. Because he's trying to help us find a pastor that fits us. And, and I will say this, I do have a pastor that I am about to go after. But I can't tell you more about that yet. I will, but I have a pastor that I'm about to go after. Um, and, and yet, Keith's coming in as well. He's got some connections here because we also are looking outside of GCI to see if there's any pastors who can understand who we are as a denomination and who we are as a church, but who understands this, this area. So Keith's coming here. We're going to talk about that. But what, is, what his goal is, he'll be here on the 1st. So I would, I would ask you all to be here. I'd ask you all to, to, to be here and, and to just be you. Just be you. We don't, we don't have, to, we have to dress up and, and, and play nicey-nice. Let's be who we are. Because I want him to see who we are, just in case the pastor that I'm going after says no. But there's, but if, if we're looking for others, I want him to be able to give a real feel of who we are. Because what Keith is, is trying to do is assess where we are, assess our area. We've spent five years looking right here at Emersonia, right? Five years. And you all are the blessing. Five years. We've gone through the neighborhood, knocking on doors, and the last time I went out, there were people, kids hiding from us. I'm not even going to lie. They, hiding, they see us and they ran. They, they hid. So I'm wondering whether, not, not that we abandon Emersonia, that we branch out a little further in Emersonia. I think we should branch out a little further. And we, I, I think we should a long time ago, but we, we branch out a little further. And, and again, we're not, all we're trying to do is get to know who these people are. I want to know what is going on around here and what we can help with. What we as a church, it's not so much to get people to come into the church, it's what can we do to be a blessing to the folks in this community? Because just on the other side of Emersonia is a whole other set of families, a whole other set of housing. Just down here, a whole other set of housing. Just on the other side of this, on the side of the highway, another set of housing. All we want to do is figure out what can we offer. What can we offer? Keith's going to come and he's going to look at that. Uh, he's a, I, I've met him, I've talked to him, Melinda's met him, um, Nicole's met him, John's met him, and again, he, he's coming here on the first, he's gonna, actually going to be here for a couple days. He's going to just drive around with me, we're going to go around the area, and I want him to talk to a couple of our pastors, talk to our pastor down in Cincinnati, 
And what Keith is really trying to get the church to do and what he's been doing as a consultant is helping the church realize that a broken world won't be released by their understanding that the church is judgmental or condemnatory. So what we've got to be able to do is figure out how do we love them? How do we help them understand what forgiveness is? How do we understand, how do we speak truth? We're never going to run from truth, ever, because Jesus never did. We're never going to run from the grace of God. We're never going to run from the hope of God. We cannot hide truth. We can't put it under, and, and bait and switch people. We've got to tell the honest truth. There are certain things that God says, and we'll talk about, there are certain things that God says we have to operate in this, in this lane. We don't get to say, you, can't, you don't have to forgive people. We don't get to say that. Because God doesn't say that. And so what, he, what he's looking at is trying to help us see that even since 2020, I stopped pastoring four years ago now. Four, almost five. So much has happened in the world in the last four to five years. That it may be time for Center Point to go through a missional relaunch. Relaunch who we are. No, my word. A relaunch of who we are, of, of what we want to project to people. What's it look like? We're, let's talk about that. How many of you have seen those ads, He Gets Us? You ever seen any of those ads? They show them during the Super Bowl? Where, again, it's like the chosen, except what they're doing is they're, they're just creating ads, and, they, and they're trying to help people realize that Jesus would get us. The people who drive by this place and see the cross on the outdoor, on, on the wall outside, I doubt they think we get them because they don't see us as them. How can we let people know we get them? How can we let people in this community know we get them? And that we want to get them. I don't know. I can tell you one way. It begins in, in Romans 14, and I won't, I won't spend a whole lot of time here because I'm going to wrap up, but... In Romans 14, this was one of the sections that John wanted me to cover. Romans 14, start of it, here's what it says. Accept one another whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters. You know, there's some things that we fight over in the church that are just disputable. And we shouldn't fight over them. There's some things we fight over that are indisputable. Or I understand. But we shouldn't fight over disputable matters. Here they were talking about what people ate and what they didn't drink or what they didn't eat. But... He, he, he's talking about things that when we, get it, when we get down to it, we want people to be able to understand that God is a God of love. Would you agree? That God is a God of love who has forgiven us. And that we've had, God forgive us of some stuff that, man, if people knew our story, right? That's their story. We want them to be able to operate in forgiveness. But our challenge is, is that we sometimes, as he says, we judge other people. We judge other people's sermons. Everybody's going to answer to God is what he's getting at in Romans 14. And on, in some disputable matters, and, and frankly, there, there are a bunch of disputable matters that we need to, frankly, stay away from. But there are others that we need to step into. God has given us a ministry of reconciliation. Let me give you a perfect example of how this is supposed to look. How many of you believe that most folks see police-community relationships as strained? Do you agree with that? That in around this area in particular? Shouldn't be, but they do. They see police-community relationships as strained, right? Here's what our police department does, our Grove City Police Department. They do what they call coffee with a cop. Different places. They just go around. They just sit down. They... Chief comes in, other people come in, and they just have coffee with folks. They go to a, the Chick-fil-A or they go to uh, the, the Panera, and they just sit down and they just get to know people. The chief gets to, tries to get to know people. Or our chief drives around in a golf cart. He just drives around in neighborhoods. He gets in a little golf cart, and he drives around in the neighborhood, meeting people, seeing neighbors who are sitting on their, in their garage or on their, uh, doing their lawn. He stops and talks to them because he wants to bridge this gap. They, they're moving around in Arts in the Alley and all these other places. They're moving around just getting to know people, talking to people. We have school resource officers in the high schools. 
not to keep the police presence, but to get to know them. One of the best people in our police department was our school resource officer. Justin Gallo, who's now a lieutenant, he's one of the best ever. But he was loving on our kids. He was protecting them, but he was loving on them. We have, we have, they do safety town. But they get out, and every year before kids go to school, they teach them about safety. And they do safety town. Did you go through safety town? Cassidy went through safety town, and Officer Misty was the safety town leader. She was five years old. And when I became a chaplain, Cassidy went in. I took her in one day, and Officer Misty had a desk, and she had a whiteboard. And Cassidy went and wrote her a note. She was probably eight or nine. She wrote her a note on her board. Hi, Officer Misty. This is Cassidy. Misty kept that note on her board until she retired two years ago. Cassidy's note, handwritten, was on her whiteboard until she retired two years ago. She makes an impact. They do drug and alcohol training. They give gun locks. They do, they do series on elder care. They come in and they teach elders how not to be scammed. Because that's been happening. Lots. This is what our police department is trying to do. They do self-defense classes for ladies. Our police department does. They, they do a citizen's police academy, all of which is designed to keep people from having to come to the police department to get to know who they are. Because people have a view of the police when you pull up behind them and turn the lights on. So they're trying to be out, be out there. What if I said that many times when people hear the church, they see blue lights and red lights? And they get that same kind of feeling when we talk about the church. What if we took off our church uniforms and went in and tried to love on people in their community? In this community, in a way that they needed it. One way that they need it is really for us to find out what would bless this community. One of the things that is coming up, we, we, that school that we, that we take the, the baskets for, the Thanksgiving baskets and the Christmas baskets, I talked to their principal at the end of last school year. He would love for us to come in and do that reading program with them. At lunch, just go in and read. I remember going in with Millie years ago. We went in, and we were going in and read during lunch with kids for a half an hour, maybe an hour. You're reading at lunchtime with a bunch of kids, one day a week. And then that program was building, and those kids increased in their grade level in reading before the end of the year. It was incredible. Would you be interested in doing something like that? Because we're already talking with them about it. That's a way we can bless the kids who live on the other side over here, on that little school. They live on Gantz, off Gantz and coming that way. Then we get the chance to help, our, help these young people recognize, and these, these adults, see that the church doesn't want anything from them other than to see, to show them what God's love looks like. That's what we're trying to do. And so I, I'd like to ask us, Please don't be afraid of what when when we're talking about living sin. Don't be afraid that, that you're going to have to do something that, that makes you completely uncomfortable. You might be the one who has to pray for us all. Okay. But I, don't, I think it's, we're not going to have to, we're not asking people to, to, to give their lives over to Jesus. We're just helping kids learn how to sound out words in one sense or do some other things. And ultimately what will happen from there is they'll get a chance to see how much God loves them. And then maybe we'll do some event here, a worship service, and they'll want to come because these people loved on my kid or these people loved on me. And Jesus will make sure they see him. They see him clearly, laughing, kidding around. Winking at them. And it'll transform their lives like he transformed yours. That's where we're going to go. That's what Keith is coming for, to come and get a feel for who we are. I'm going to take him around. I'm going to take him over to the school. I'm going to show him what we've been doing. But ultimately, the goal that I have for us and for every church that I look after is let's realize that the days of the open invitation where everybody will come here, those days kind of closed up around the end of the 20th century. 
We're going to have to go to them and let them know what God's love looks like in real time. And when God has the questions get answered, get asked, we can answer them. Let's love people first. We keep coming and celebrating this way. Let's pray. Father, your, your forgiveness of us, the debt we owed you, was amazing. But the way you reached us was something powerful. The way you reached us was personal, but it was a different time, even then. As we continue to walk, Lord, we've got friends who have deep questions about you. We have friends who don't know you. We have friends who think that, and people around us who, who, who struggle. They need help, but they don't know where to look. I pray that you will help us to get out of our own way and let your love do its job. That, Lord, we can help people grow the way you did in real time. Loving people, teaching people, blessing people. Using great stories that was teaching them the deeper message about you. May you help us be able to do that even better. We love you and we praise you. And may this last song that we sing, may it reach us. May it speak to us. May it, may it gather all the other things we've been talking about and thinking about and make it make sense. Lord, you are good. You are wonderful. We appreciate you in Jesus' name.